Good morning and thank you for attending police headquarters. My name is Constable Carolyn DeClute and I'm here today to introduce Deputy Chief Jim Raymer of the Toronto Police Service who will be updating you on Project Chronic. Good morning everyone and thank you for attending today. Last May, the Toronto Police Service's Gun and Gang Unit uh, it started Project Chronic, a complex criminal investigation focused on the Driftwood Crips and their associates, a group that we are alleging has shown an extreme propensity for violence in their shootings of rival gang members and a blatant disregard for public, public safety. Like many organized crime groups, their involvement in guns, drugs and violence formed a complex network. As a result, to appropriately respond to this network, we developed a joint task force and ultimately were assisted by 16 other police agencies. Only through a, this coordination were we able to safely and success, successfully execute Project Chronic in the early morning hours on June 15th. An enforcement response that required the assistance of more than 800 police officers. These projects do not happen overnight. The collaboration of law enforcement on this scale is only done to respond to the most serious threats to public safety. As we continue to recognize the complex needs of our city, we will continue to find new and innovative ways to provide our neighborhoods with this effective response. In addition to our enforcement activity, this is the very first time we have partnered with social services. Several individuals have been referred to these community agencies so they can avoid a life of crime and incarceration. The Toronto Police Service will continue to look for ways that incorporate these services in our policing response. We believe that community partnerships make for safer neighbourhoods. I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize our primary police partners on this project. Rep representatives from the Ontario Provincial Police, York Region Police and the Greater Sudbury Police Service have joined with us here today. And as I've already mentioned, on behalf of Chief Saunders and the Toronto Police Service, I want to thank the other 16 police services as well. Our shared commitment to, commun to safer communities is what made Project Chronic such a success. I'd now like to introduce Inspector Peter Marrera of our Integrated Gun and Gang Task Force to provide you with details from the project. Good morning, I'm uh, Peter Morera. I'm the officer in charge of the Integrated Gun and Gang Task Force. Over the past several months, I've been before you to talk about some of the significant arrests uh, that have been made by members of uh, several of the subunits uh, in the Integrated Gun and Gang Task Force. Today, I'm here to talk about a lengthy investigation that was undertaken by our major project section. In May of last year, Officers from the Gun and Gang Task Force Major Projects Section commenced an investigation to the Driftwood Crips Street Gang. This group had been the focus of a large-scale investigation in 2007 that was named Project Cryptic. And again, some members arrested yesterday were part of Project Marvel in 2011. 19 of those arrested yesterday were convicted in one or both of those previous investigations. In the early days of the investigation, it became apparent that this group's criminal interests went well beyond our city limits. Recognizing the damage and violent impact this criminal organization was having on communities both in the city and beyond, Project Chronic was born. Toronto Police Integrated Gun and Gang Task Force was the, took the lead role uh, in the investigation and was partnered, by the, uh, partnered with the Ontario Provincial Police Provincial Weapons Enforcement Unit today represented here by Detective Inspector Bill Klim. The York Regional Police Organized Crime Bureau represented today here by Inspector Henry DeRuiter. And with the Greater Sudbury Police Service represented here today by Inspector Dan DePazzi. As a result of the extensive investigation, we allege that the Driftwood Crips were a structured criminal organization with multiple cells operating throughout Ontario, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Drug trafficking was the main activity for this group. We also allege that weapons, some of those are here beside me, and violence or the threat of violence were used to further and protect that drug trade. The Driftwood Crips have a clear hierarchy with some of its leaders even operating and directing from within correctional facilities. This point speaks uh, directly to the influence and power of the group's leadership. Members of this group have been involved in numerous reckless acts, including shootings, kidnappings, 
firearm offenses, armed sexual assaults, robberies, drug trafficking, and other serious criminal offenses. The wanton disregard for public safety during the commission of these offenses was nothing short of appalling. Recognizing the danger this group uh, posed to our communities, we, along with our partners, took action. The details of these events will be revealed in the pending court proceedings. As Chief Saunders informed you yesterday morning, over 800 police officers representing many Ontario Police Services simultaneously executed 77 warrants at residences in Toronto, York Region, Peel Region, Niagara Region, Durham Region, and in the greater Sudbury area. Cooperation amongst police services across the province is the norm today. Without ongoing multi-jurisdictional uh, collaboration, we simply cannot experience the types of successes we experienced yesterday and throughout this investigation. As you can appreciate, to coordinate and execute a takedown plan with so many violent gang members involving multiple police agencies is no easy task. In fact, it takes months of planning and dedication. I'd like to thank the members of our major project section who were assisted by virtually every division within our city and investigative unit for their tireless work in effectively dismantling this latest group of criminals operating under the name of the Driftwood Crips. Additionally, on behalf of the Toronto Police Service, I'd like to thank our partner agencies represented here today for the contribution and dedication, dedicating the necessary resources, and those resources were significant to, to make this investigation a success. I'd like to acknowledge and name the, the police services that assisted us uh, uh, in particular uh, yesterday. The Pe Peel, Halton, Niagara, Hamilton, Waterloo, London, Guelph, Sarnia, Brantford, Barrie, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Durham, Kingston, Belleville, North Bay, and the Sault Ste. Marie Police Services. Thank you. In terms of uh, parties arrested, um, as of yesterday, there were 90 arrests that were made and 485 charges laid, the details of which will be provided immediately following this news conference. So I won't spend a, a lot of time there, but I will tell you that we expect to make 35 more arrests with a balance of 133 <coughs> more charges to be laid, and that uh, will be occurring in the next couple of days within the Toronto area. In a breakdown, this amounts to 86 charges relating to participating in a criminal organization, an attempted murder, 55 robbery-related charges, 73 um, charges relating to firearms possession, 32 firearms trafficking, 15 kidnapping charges, 39 trafficking of cocaine, and 11 trafficking of fentanyl. <clears throat> What is significant about the drug arrests, I, I will uh, suggest, is the uh, fentanyl seizures. There was 193 fentanyl patches seized during this investigation with a street value in Toronto of just over $38,000. In the greater Sudbury area, we estimate that this would rise to just over $86,000. And uh, there was 194 fentanyl pills, um, street value in Toronto, of just over $15,000 in the greater Sudbury area, just over uh, $23,000. Uh, I can, the fentanyl is a rising uh, problem uh, within uh, this province and this country, and uh, this is a significant seizure for us. There were, uh, thus far in the project, there's been 18 uh, firearms that have been seized, 14 of those are handguns. Uh, seven magazines, high capacity magazines, and about 208 rounds of ammunition. There's also been a, approximately 177,000 just over um, Canadian dollars seized as proceeds of crime. We've executed 105 warrants, 72 of which are controlled, controlled drugs and substances acts related. One area of concern that we as police officers have identified with uh, gang membership is recidivism. Many young men and some women are drawn to the allure of the gang lifestyle. Sadly, this is short-lived and is often replaced with intimidation, fear, physical violence, and in many cases, murder. With this in mind, yesterday, gang unit officers offered each and every arrested gang member the opportunity to seek help with assistance from external agencies to leave this dangerous gang lifestyle. 
As an organization, we recognize that while enforcement is necessary for community safety, prevention is ultimately the solution. We are not naive, however. We know that prevention is challenging and gang culture is extremely difficult to penetrate. Nevertheless, it is an area that the Toronto Police Service acknowledges and strives to build on. We have been working diligently with many groups, agencies, boards, and building our, capac our collective capacity to meet the complex needs of the city and those caught up in this dangerous lifestyle. As the Chief said yesterday, public safety is not just the responsibility of the police alone. I am hopeful that this message resonates with some of the arrested individuals or their families. Where there are gangs, there is violence. Even if we convince one individual to strive for something better in life, we've made the, the city and the province a safer place. While we marked a milestone yesterday, the investigation is far from over. Many criminal uh, investigations remain active and I'm optimistic that we can conclude some recent cases. Of course, recent court decisions make it mandatory to move cases along quickly, so we must continue to dedicate significant resources to meet our obligations. And as always, we will work closely with the Crown Attorney's Office to do so. I would also be remiss if I did not speak directly to the community members who were affected by the presence of armed police officers in their neighborhoods during the early morning hours yesterday. We realize that this can be unsettling for many, the vast majority of who are honest, hardworking, productive citizens. Understanding that our number one priority is your safety and the safety of your family. Removing violent gang members, many armed from a community, requires an armed presence on the part of police. This is an accomplishment when you see the type of firepower that is out there in evidence on display here today. A safe community is not a state in which we arrive, rather it's a continuous effort which balances enforcement, vigilance and community building. It is our belief that communities are safer today as a result of the efforts yesterday and throughout this investigation. We thank you for your patience and understanding. You have our commitment that we will continue to strive to make Toronto the safest place to live, work and be. I'll uh, now take some questions, but obviously, as you can appreciate the cases uh, before the courts, there's many outstanding investigations uh, uh, still being conducted, and so I may be limited in what I can offer today. Can you tell us again how many firearms have you actually seized? Uh, in total, there was 18 firearms seized Sorry. thus far. Inspector, I want to ask you something about the, you mentioned the other services and the fact that you noticed in this investigation that it went out to the province. A couple of things on that. Is that something new, or has that happened before? And you know, I know you have to go before the courts, but I think a lot of us are wondering, and maybe the Sudbury officer can address this too, is, is the gang in Sudbury, members of the gang running things, or is, is it the, the weapons and the drugs and all that shipped up there, and there's low, how does that work? So there's a two-part question. All right, um, so in terms of, uh, in terms of your question regarding the Sudbury angle, I won't speak for the Sudbury Police Service. I'll, I'll, I can off, offer the mic to my colleague uh, to answer those questions. But I can tell you that uh, we, we're alleging that the Driftwood Crips are, um, operate under many different cells and uh, that those cells uh, are involved in the drug trafficking. So you can draw your own conclusions from, from what I've said. Um, the, this is not something uh, new. It's becoming increasingly more common though. Uh, criminal elements know no boundaries. And so when you have the type of cooperation that you see demonstrated today, I can tell you that this is a very public display of what happens on a daily basis. Um, my unit is called the Integrated Gun and Gang Task Force. We work with many law enforcement and, and government um, bodies uh, within the same building in order to accomplish the public safety outcomes that uh, we see here today. Um, the cooperation goes on, the public doesn't see it, and we have an opportunity here to acknowledge the partnerships that are made. You've arrested 90 people, uh, taken 18 firearms off the uh, streets, you've also removed a bunch of drugs. What kind of a difference do you think this represents to the community? Uh, I think the chief said uh, it the best, it's the start. So uh, the community uh, now has an opportunity, we're working with um, city uh, agencies to uh, get into those communities. Uh, communities have been plagued by violence uh, for so a long period of time. Um, and uh, we're gonna work, we're gonna do our part, but it, it's, it's not 
just left up to the police. And, and like I said before, it's you know a safe community is not something you uh, arrive at. It's something that you have to continue uh, continually monitor and uh, uh, conduct enforcement efforts uh, for sure. Now, this is your third project involving the Driftwood Crips. You say that you've done this twice before, and yet they seem to just keep coming back. How do you feel about your chances of really making a difference here, given it just seems year after year they just keep reorganizing, reforming, and they keep continuing with this, the experimental activities? Um, that, that's a fair question, and I can tell you that um, we feel that we've made a significant impact on public safety by seizing even one firearm and removing the ammunition and the guns and, 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 their, um, and the drugs and their money. Um, these, are, these are the reasons that they're in business, and so we'll continue to, to uh, work at our part of the community safety piece. But I acknowledge that many of the underlying problems far exceed the policing boundaries. And so those are areas that we're working and taking uh, some tax, working with government agencies and, and social groups to try to identify the best ways to solve this on a long-term basis. But the community now can breathe a sigh of relief that we've removed uh, you know, some very, very bad people from the streets. Anyone during the arrest yesterday? Uh, was pardon? anyone injured, police, or uh, anyone else injured during the arrest yesterday? Uh, there were, uh, there was one very minor injury. That, by? Uh, someone who was present at the, one of the search warrants. Detective, you, you mentioned that some of the uh, criminal activity being controlled from inside prison. Um, Two part question. Number one, is that somebody that's, uh, those people that are being controlling higher ups in the Driftwood Crips gang? And number two, um, if it's being controlled from inside the prison walls, is there any way that yourself or other branches of law enforcement can do to contain that, to stop it, if it's being done from inside prison walls? Um, I, I won't speak directly to that second part. Uh, it, it may suggest some inv um, how we conduct investigations, and uh, that's not something I want to educate anyone on. Um, but I can tell you that um, the people giving orders, we're, we will allege, are amongst the leadership group of this organization. I understand that you can't get to specifics of how you would do it, but what I was trying to ask is, if it's being controlled from inside the walls, is there anything that can be done to stop that from happening, or is that just something that happens inside prison? I mean, like any kind of criminal activity that takes place anywhere. Right, so the, I mean, they're, they're controlling from the inside, yeah. which is where you think you put them away, but I mean, obviously it's still happening, so is there something that can be done to stop that? Um, well, we'll undertake those kind of investigative efforts. I, I can't answer that question without speaking to some of the things that we do. Of the 90 people arrested, are you significant in the hierarchy of this gang? Yeah, so the list will be published, and, and uh, I'm sure you can go back and, and have a look at the people arrested in the other projects, and, and they'll be highlighted. Um, I'm not going to get into where we place the significance. That will be played out within the trials themselves for these individuals. I know that um, the chief had mentioned yesterday that you, know, you talked about things like cocaine, heroin, Yes, I just touched upon the highlights of it. We could spend a long time here together talking about the types of things that were seized, yes. Inspector, uh, to Janice's question earlier about uh, the, the previous rates, the last one happened, I think, in 2007 under... 11. 2011 under Chief Blair. Um, can you talk about how the gang was able to or not able to recover from that raid and uh, tackling the infrastructure this time? I mean, I, I can't speak to why that happened, but it, um, it did happen. Uh, many of the underlying reasons why people are involved in criminal lifestyle, again, far uh, exceed the role of the police and, and the type of policing issues that uh, we face in this city. Um, the, the reality is, is that um, gang lifestyle, people find themselves in a quagmire. Um, you know, they can't get out. It's, uh, they become addicted to many of the different aspects of that lifestyle, and so they will continue to go back. And that's something that we are now investing heavily in, in working with uh, partner agencies, external agencies, to try to identify and combat at the earliest opportunity. So can you give us a bit of a, a background on the Driftwood Crips, when they first popped up in Toronto, and kind of how they were able to develop uh, so quickly and spread uh, to so many communities? Well, like most gangs, they're geographically located, and so people are from a geographical area or so affiliated to a geographical area. And um, uh, I 
I don't have any specific information at this point here that I can offer you in terms of the Driftwood Crips exactly, but I can tell you that um, uh, they have been around for some period of time and, and, we'll and if they pop up again, we'll continue to um, tackle the issues that they cause. Do you think you've taken out the gang though? I mean, do you think that the Driftwood Crips, there are cells that, that still exist within Ontario or? or do well, you, I, do I think that. I think I have. I think I have 35 more arrests to make. Um, so, at this point, I, I'm, that's what I'll leave my answer at. And after after those 35 arrests, that are confident that the gang essentially was eliminated. I mean, certainly the the elements that we've been able to identify. Yes. Peter, um, you mentioned about. And I don't know if you have somebody here from the social services, but I wouldn't mind hearing a little bit more about that. Two things. You approached every person's arrested, and I assume you'll do the same with the 35 with an opportunity to walk away from the game. That's new? You've never done that before? Um, yeah, t the way we did it, yes. And yeah. the second part is, uh, which jumps out, did anybody accept? I don't know if you can say that or not, because that could put them at risk. But I mean, was there any success there? And, w and what does it mean? What, what happens in the social part of it? What, what are you offering to? Uh, well, you know, I, I think that yesterday we started the conversation with many uh, young people, and I think that that's the most important part and uh, and what I would term this a success that we uh, began to put into place something that they will think about and consider, and uh, and we'll give them many opportunities to access th that help. In terms of what help, I think. Um, each individual external group that we um, are talking with and partnered with and continue to develop a strategy together and I hope to be able to report back to uh, the public uh, in the near future as to what that actually looks like and answer many of your questions in depth. Well, it jumps out at me that the uh, private sector, that would be a, an opportunity to partner with the public sector, but the other thing I wondered, you didn't mention diversion at all, is that, is that part of it or is that something completely different? These charges are separate, but this is outside of that, or uh, is it diverted? Th this is outside of that, yeah. yes. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, I just, if, um, as you said, some of the activity was being controlled from ins or directed from inside prisons uh, by the higher-ups, um, how can you be, or why are you so confident that, that you've made a significant dent if, with, with these arrests, if so much of it is being controlled from inside prison? Well, I think I've made, I, th I think the team has made significant um, a dent in this group because of the number of arrests we've made. There's no one to operate uh, um, the cells that we've been able to identify. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the fact that people are directing from correction facilities is an interesting uh, point, but certainly not new in this province. Uh, but it, it what it does illustrate is the power that some people have over groups of people. Uh, and so it, it far exceeds, you know, just the simple relationship and because of proximity, you're somebody who's locked up and can still give orders to other people that we will allege other people carry out. And, you know, just to his point, I, I, we didn't mention siblings, but, you know, I, I think that might play into it. Have you done any scientific study, Peter, on between 2007, 11 and now, and the family lines, is that part of this? Uh, no, it hasn't been formed part of it. Is, is it a legitimate uh, thing to look at? Like for us, is there brothers and sisters and things like that that go down the line? Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's an interesting concept and I think it's something that um, maybe one of the social agencies, one of our partners might look at. Last question? If there's any uh, questions for our partner agencies, you want no, well, Greater Sudbury? Who's, who's all here? 